uh, different fluids give rise to different assumptions on what are called the Navier Stokes equations. And based on the Navier Stokes equations, they're too hard to do in full complexity. And so you make certain assumptions about viscosity to be able to remove certain terms and allow solvability and reasonable time on the computer. Of course, an aircraft is not just cylindrical, you have other things, so then you have to get into things like finite elements. But better first imagine, understand the simplest ones. <laughs> That's what this course only gives you the first stages of PDEs are extremely complex. And numerical PDEs are hard to learn. All right, so here, uh, this again, this sort of relates to the um, uh, how two that you have on the uh, lecture activity is how do we get the Laplacian operator in uh, polar coordinates. Mm -hmm. So, looking at this particular one, so let me go back to, remember we were looking at the Laplacian in X and Y. We have the second partial of U with respect to X squared. So this is the Laplacian of U in rectangular. It's like that. Okay? And we see we've got two partials in X and two partials in Y, right? How many boundary conditions did we need to specify for that rectangular problem? We needed four, right? And if you think about it, two partials in X, two partials in Y, that adds up to four conditions, doesn't it? Do you agree with that? Okay. Here we got a circle. Notice this is effectively two partial. If you do the product rule on this, you're going to at least have a two partials in R plus another one. And you're going to have two partials in theta, right? So how many boundary conditions do I need? I need four again. Now, one of the boundary conditions is going to be specified by the temperature around the actual boundary of that disk. That's one. Okay. You would A and theta is some type of theta. All right. We still need three. Anybody see some things? Like, I've sort of hinted at it up here because we've kind of made it look like a rectangle, don't we? How did we make it look like a rectangle? We made a little cut over here. It's an artificial cut, but we're saying that when we go to pi and when we go to minus pi, those cuts match up, right? And we solved the periodic boundary condition before, didn't we? And when we did that periodic boundary condition, what did we do with it? We did the ring. We had the temperatures were equal at plus or minus pi. But what else did we also have there? So the flux matched. So the partials matched on there. Okay. So we have the periodic boundary conditions that u for all values of r at minus pi is the same as u at r and pi. And we have the flux. And that flux is perpendicular to that line is with respect to theta. So the partial with respect to theta for all values of r at minus pi is going to equal to the u theta of r and pi. Okay. Those, by the way, are nice homogeneous boundary conditions there. We sort of suggest already that in the theta, we should be getting the stern legal problem. Okay? The stern legal problem should arise from the theta. All right. How many boundary conditions have we got now? Three. We're still missing one. Can anyone think of, what about polar coordinates? Are there any problems in polar coordinates? So we just want to be able to 
particular point that's a problem. Where is it? The center, right? The origin. The origin is a singularity because that particular prop point there, r is equal to zero, and theta can be anything, right? <clears throat> so there's sort of a singularity at that particular point. And so we have one more, and it turns out it's also a homogeneous boundary condition, is we don't want this thing to have runaway temperatures. Is that reasonable? We're bounded. So it turns out that we get an implicit boundary condition that at r equals zero, independent of theta, we're bounded. It's less than infinity. Okay? That makes sense. Now we have our four boundary conditions. Granted, this last boundary condition doesn't seem to doesn't seem too restrictive, but it will it will it will definitely help solve things. Question? Yes. Does that just imply that a limit exists there? Yes. Okay. It just says it goes to some value. Can you guess what value it's going to go to? Anybody's intuition? If I'm looking at steady state temperature, I've got f of theta around the boundary. What should it be at the center? It should be the average of that f of theta. There's no initial condition because this is a boundary value problem, right? But it should be the average temperature at the middle. That's going to give rise to important theorems called the maximum and minimum principle that we've worked with. Okay. So <clears throat> if we let if we let the u We let the u of r and theta be some uh, phi of theta. Now remember I said the homogeneous one is going to be those periodic ones, right? Because the r has that non-homogeneous one around. So we expect our Sturm-Louisville problem to arise from the phi of theta. Again, one of the secrets of all of these is you gotta find the Sturm Louisville problem. Okay, so going back to that operator, <clears throat> we're gonna have uh, letting it equal to that. You can see that we just get this. Uh, so again, it was one over r, the partial with respect to uh, r of r, partial of u with respect to r uh, plus uh, 1 over r squared uh, second partial of u with respect to theta squared equals c. All right, and so now we can see that we get this, um, we get this particular value here. And let me rearrange this. And you can see that we could rearrange this into a, a, a phi double prime over phi. All right, phi double prime over phi is going to be equal to uh, minus phi double prime over phi is equal to minus uh, one over r. Derivative with respect to R of R, the derivative of G with respect to R, all divided by um, uh, what is that? G over R squared. Okay. Minus, with the denominator is what's left over there. And now you can see this, this only depends on phi, or only depends on theta, this only depends on r, right? And so that's going to be equal to some minus lambda. Okay? So we got our two ODs. 
first one, b double prime plus lambda phi equals zero. All right. Now the second one, all right, we're going to have um, a derivative with respect to r of r, the derivative of g with respect to r, and then minus, notice I, uh, if I flip this over, I'm just going to give it g over r lambda equals zero. I think I've done that right. Put this over here, you're going to have a g over r, divided by r, so you're going to get a g over r uh, lambda, bring it back over to this side. If I, if I, uh, Let's go ahead and multiply through by, uh, well, if I do my product rule on this, we can see it's going to be the uh, first times the root of the second, so that's going to be an R G double prime uh, plus the second times the root of the first, which is going to be a G prime, and then we're going to get minus lambda G over R. Anybody recognize this particular equation here? Let me give you let me give you a little hint on that. So multiply through by r. Second order homogeneous. Well, second order homogeneous. We'll go to that. Bernoulli. Now Bernoulli's. Bernoulli's was a first order method. solutions of e to the lambda t, these we tried solutions of r to the alpha, Cauchy-Euler equations, oh, yeah. Cauchy-Euler equations, now you remember that. You just try, and so these were trying exponential solutions, these were, were trying powers of the variable r. Okay, now you remember that? in advance thinking of what we're going to get. Now, the significant things on the boundary conditions, what about the boundary conditions? Well, we're going to have that phi of minus pi is equal to phi of pi, and we have phi prime at minus pi is equal to phi prime. So then again, coming up with this, <clears throat> we have the stern louisville problem. Phi double prime plus lambda phi zero. Let me write it in homogeneous form. Uh, phi of minus pi minus phi of pi equals zero, phi prime of minus pi minus phi prime of pi equals zero. Okay, that's our Stern Louisville problem with its homogeneous. Again, we've already solved this particular one. We solved it before. The difference was that was that was looking at that ring that was connected. Okay. Do you remember the ring on that one? Then what about the lambda equals zero? That was an eigenvalue. Yes. It was a constant. And it gave rise to a phi 
zero of theta not equaling one. Okay. We also got we also then looked at the other ones and what did we get? We got both the sines and the cosines. Because because the functions matched, they're matching at pi and minus pi. We matched at L and minus L before. So the difference now, <clears throat> okay, so the difference on this particular one, let me just write up here periodic. So the difference being is that, that we now have instead of L, we have pi for our two influence, all right? And so then we got for those, that particular one, we got lambda n, well, it was n squared pi squared over L squared, but now L is equal to pi, so we just get n squared, okay? So then we're just gonna get lambda n is n squared, our eigenvalues and our eigenfunction in this case is going to be equal to some uh, a n cosine n theta plus a b n sine n go back and look at the ring and you'll see this is exactly the same thing as we Cautious and cinches, trivial solution only. So we can only get the land just like that. Right. So there's our, there, that's the solution to our uh, string Louisville problem. So let's look at let's look at this particular equation down here. All right. So everybody sort of remember this from the ring. And I don't want to repeat all the, the details because they're just kind of tedious of going over them. <clears throat> all right. So let's look at I want to emphasize this. You always sort of have to look at that lambda equals zero as a special case. So let's go back to uh, this differential equation. In fact, I'm going to go back to this form of it. It's a little bit easier to work at than at this one. So I look at that particular one, and I put lambda equals zero. Then we're looking at the derivative with respect to r okay, of r, the derivative of g0 with respect to r, and that's going to be equal to 0, isn't it? Lambda equals 0, and this equation says that's true. Okay, that should be a pretty easy one to solve now. Let's solve it. How are we going to solve it? You can just integrate. Total derivative equals zero, you can just integrate. So we do one integration, and we're going to get, that's going to imply that r, derivative of g0 with respect to r, is going to be equal to some constant. Right? Now let's look at, so we now have the derivative of g0 with respect to r, is going to be equal to C1 over R. Again, total derivative is equal to a function of R. We can integrate this, can't we? And we're going to get G0 of R. Divide integrating C1 over R. Okay, we're going to get a C1 natural log of R plus a C2, okay? Okay, 
okay, now we want to take advantage of what happens in the limit as r goes to zero. goes to zero, this becomes unbounded if C1 is non-zero, right? So necessarily C1 must equal zero for boundedness. So that tells me my G0 as a function of R is simply going to be equal to C2 constant. So as r goes to zero, as r goes to zero, log of zero is log of zero is natural log of zero. Same thing. Is it negative infinity? It's minus infinity. Right. Is that bounded? No. No. Yeah. What condition did we put up to zero? That it was bounded. It was bounded. Right. So necessarily, if C1 were non-zero this would go to infinity. Right. So necessarily, C1 must be zero. That's the boundedness condition coming into play. All right. OK, let's go to, the, let's go to this one. So now we're going to look at r squared gn double prime plus r gn prime minus n squared g n equaling z. I said, I should remind you of being a Cauchy-Euler equation, right? So we make a we make a an assumption, we're gonna let g n of r be equal to some uh, r raised to the alpha power. Right? And if we have that we're going to get <clears throat> we're going to get taking two derivatives of this <clears throat> two derivatives <clears throat> are going it's going to give us an r squared and then we're going to get an alpha alpha minus 1 r to the alpha minus 2 right two derivatives plus r. Taking one derivative, you're going to get an alpha r to the alpha minus 1. And here, we're going to get a minus n squared uh, r to the alpha. Okay? All right, I think everybody can see you could factor out an r to the alpha. And what are you left with? This is called, if you remember, you probably don't remember this, but it was called the auxiliary equation rather than the characteristic equation. So you get the auxiliary equation is alpha, alpha minus 1, plus alpha minus m squared. So that's an r to the alpha. Notice here we're going to get an alpha squared minus alpha plus alpha minus m squared. And that's got to be equal to zero. Okay. Again, I'll remind you, this is the auxiliary equation. <clears throat> so, what is alpha equal to? What's alpha n equal to? We're going to have two solutions, so we're going to get plus or minus n. So that tells me that my gn as a function of r is going to be some c1 
r c1 r to the minus n plus a c2 r to the n power. Right? Now, as r tends to zero, remember again, n equals one to As r goes to zero, what must be true in this equation over here? To satisfy our boundedness condition. You must have c1 equals zero. c1 equals zero for boundedness. And so now we get gn as a function of r. Must be some constant c2. And so now we've got, we've got our phi ends and our g ends for this particular problem. Okay, we'll finish it next time. So all this reminding you what you've done, you have done this before. If you don't remember, it's